Morning, everyone, and welcome to another Christ First Church online service. I hope you're all doing well and ready to be greatly encouraged. As usual, we've got a great lineup this morning, starting by honoring our King, Jesus, through some worship and communion. Alongside having some of our church fam sharing on the wonderful promises of God, we've also got the incredible Frankie Talo from Faith City Church in Auckland, bringing a word of encouragement for all of us. And speaking of uh, words of encouragement, we've got Mark Meesk faithfully preaching the message today that will no doubt help us in continuing to fix our eyes on Jesus. Tonight, we continue with our Zoom prayer meetings at 7 p.m. as we seek God's direction through these times. I hope to see you there. Another thing on top of that, we have life groups back on 7 p.m. on Wednesdays. So if you need any more information on that, get in touch with your life group leader. And finally, before we get into worship, here's a portion of scripture shared in our church earlier this year. A blessing that was given to Israel and a blessing that I pray we too can experience right now. From Numbers 6. Then the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons to bless the people of Israel with this special blessing. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord uh, smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. In Jesus name, I pray we experience this to the fullest and most tangible extent. Bless you all. Proclaim my love 
Good morning, everyone. Let us partake of communion now. In Hebrews 12 and verse 2, it says, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Why does he say it was a joy to go to the cross? He knew that by going to the cross, he could restore the intimate relationship the Father had with us that was lost in the garden. He suffered and died, but rose again so that we could be with him for eternity. This bread we are about to take symbolizes his body broken for us. Let us take the bread. This juice symbolizes his blood, which was poured out to cleanse us and forgive us of our sins. Let us take the juice. Thank you, Jesus, that because of your death, our relationship with the Father has been restored. Amen. Uh, greetings, Christ First Church. Greetings, Mark and Cole and Craig and Sonia, Andrew and Margaret, um, Carl and Elise. It's been really good to see your YouTube videos of the songs you guys have been reading, um, writing. So it's been awesome seeing that. Um, also, Jean and Jess. Uh, Jean, um, it's been awesome watching you lead worship and growing in their gift. So well done, you guys. Well done to everybody out in Nelson. Well done. And I just want to send you greetings all the way from Auckland. Um, we absolutely love you guys. Um, Mike and Bev. Um, Jude, Andrew, Connor and, and Eleanor, it's been good to see your little baby growing. So um, greetings from us to you and, and it's my privilege to bring just a quick encouragement in. And the quick encouragement comes from 1 Timothy 1.18 and it says this, So Timothy, my son, I'm entrusting you with this responsibility in keeping with the very first prophecies that were spoken over your life. And now in the process of fulfillment in this great work of ministry, in keeping with the prophecies spoken over you with this encouragement, use your prophecies as a weapon as you wage spiritual warfare by faith and with a clean conscience, for there are many who reject their virtues and are now destitute in the true faith. And I want to encourage you, um, it says over here, with this encouragement, use your prophecies as weapons. And I want to encourage you, Christ First Church, I want to encourage you, everybody, pull out what God's been speaking. Pull out, um, pull out all those prophecies. What we've seen through Scripture and what I've always taught is that songs always preceded movements, but what preceded the song was the Word of the Lord. So I want to encourage you guys, wherever you're at, sit there at the dinner, dinner table, sit around with your loved ones. But I, I want to encourage you, pull out the prophecies. Have a look at what God's spoken, spoken over you. While the world is screaming chaos, it's time for us as a church to be a church of convergence where we use this opportunity to, to strengthen our swords and just remind us of who we are in God. So bless you guys heaps. Bless you guys. Bless you guys. Bless you guys. Thanks guys. Mark has asked me to briefly look at a promise of God's pardon from Isaiah 1 verse 18. That verse says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they're as red as crimson, they shall be like wool. What I love about this promise of God's pardon is that it's future tense. Our sins are like scarlet, but they will be like wool. We know that in Christ all of our sins were nailed to the cross. But the exciting thing is we can keep coming to the cross even today. Christ died once and for all for our sins, but his mercy and his forgiveness are ongoing. Hallelujah. Psalm 84 verse 11. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. I love this verse. It's a verse on which I have based my life and my business dealings. 
I have come to know and trust that he will always provide and that he will honour me if I honour him and if I seek to uphold his standards in all of my dealings with people and in business. In John 15, 7, it says, If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask for whatever you wish and my Father will do it for you. That is such a wonderful promise of the Lord's provision over our lives, but it remains in this context of us remaining in Him. It's about seeking relationship with the Lord. It's about partnering with His Spirit in everything we do and everything we say. And our prayers are powerful because of that. Morning, everyone. So this could potentially be our last online meeting as we await the government's announcement tomorrow regarding churches being able to gather again in groups of more than 10. And so, of course, the hope is that we can meet in our building again from this coming weekend. So watch the space. And so as fun as this has been, I must say it is time to come back together again. And I, for one, cannot wait. So we're going to continue our series, Feeding Our Faith on the Promises of God. And this morning we're into part three. And so let me just uh, recap a little. Week one, we unpacked Proverbs 4, verse 20 to 20 through to 27, as we looked at how we can feed our faith by listening to God's word, by seeing it, believing those promises, by thinking about them, meditating on them, by fourthly speaking and confessing them, and then lastly, by obeying God's promises and his word. And so last week, we looked at how we can stand on the promises of God those very great and precious promises that 2 Peter 1 verse 4 talks about, but then also how we can apply those promises to different aspects of our lives or to the things that we're facing. But I also shared some ground rules when it came to standing on the promises of God. And firstly, we need to know what God has said and what he has promised us, which means then that we cannot be Bible illiterate or ignorant of the promises that God has spoken and that he has given to us. And of course, let me remind you, there are no shortcuts in achieving this. Secondly, we need to personalize those great and precious promises. In other words, we need to make them our own and then, of course, apply them to what we're facing and what we're going through. And then thirdly, we need to proclaim and speak those promises out, speak them out to God, to ourselves, to the devil, or even to the situation that we may be facing. Now, last week, We looked at three areas that are very relevant for us at this time. Promises around God's protection, firstly. Secondly, promises about his provision. And then thirdly, promises that speak about his peace. Or to put it another way, promises that promise us his peace. Now this morning, I want to share another three areas of life where we can appropriate and and apply the promises of God. And so the first of those is the pardon of God, sticking with the peace. In other words, what promises has God given us regarding his pardon, his promise of forgiveness? Because unless we know what he has promised us, we could potentially miss out on the forgiveness and the reconciliation and the healing that is promised and and available to us. But before we can experience the pardon of God, we need to acknowledge our sin before God. Because unless we see the sin in us, Why would we want the forgiveness that Jesus offers to us? Now in Psalm 32, verses 1 to 5 is an amazing psalm. And David begins by making this incredible declaration here in verse 1, when he says, Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. And I'm sure you would agree with me by saying, wow, What a truth, what an incredible promise. But then David looks back and he says, when I kept silent, in other words, when I was slow to acknowledge and confess my sin, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. And you know, that's what the conviction of the Holy Spirit can feel like when we ignore his voice and his promptings. But then he goes on and he says, Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. 
And so it's because of that forgiveness that David could declare this opening statement with such confidence and with such assurance when he says, blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them and in whose spirit is no deceit. But you know, the starting point is acknowledging and owning up to the fact that we do sin, that we do mess up, that we do miss God's mark rather than us trying to conceal it or run away from it or even hide from it as Adam and Eve did. We need to acknowledge it and confess. You know, Proverbs 28, 13 tells us that whoever conceals their sin does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. And so these are promises then that we need to know, that we need to stand on, that we need to apply to our lives, especially when we sin. You know, David wants to be so sure that he's not concealing any sin from God that it's almost like he takes extra precautions when he says in Psalm 19, verses 12 and 13, but who can discern their own errors? And in case I can't, he says, forgive my hidden faults, not just the ones I'm aware of, but the ones that I'm not aware of. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Because you know, that's what sin wants to do, whether it's willful or not. It wants to rule and have dominion over us. Then he goes on and he says, then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. And you know, when we don't deal with our our issues and our willful sin, we end up being guilty, not innocent, but guilty of great transgression. And so what about the New Testament? What promises has God given us that we can stand on when it comes to his forgiveness? Well, 1 John 1 verse 9 is one of those promises. And yet let's read from verse 8, where John writing and he says, if we claim to be without sin, We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Remember, that was written to believers. Verse 9, if we confess our sin, He, Jesus, is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And you know, this needs to be our go-to scripture when we mess up, when we grieve the heart of the Father because of our sin. And so rather than running from God or hiding from God because of our shame, we need to run to God, knowing that there is forgiveness, there is cleansing, and there is healing in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Or as the writer of Hebrews chapter 8, verse 12 says, For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. And of course, he's quoting Jeremiah 31, verse 34. And remember, no more means no more. And so God chooses not to remember those sins because as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Psalm 103 verse 12. But only when we come to confess and repent of our sin. And so God's promises of pardon are the greatest promises of all because they are promises that keep us in right standing with God. And they're promises that equally connect us or keep us connected to our Father in heaven. Secondly, what about promises of prosperity? Now, sadly, the prosperity gospel has done a great harm or done a lot of harm in us understanding and believing that God indeed wants to prosper us. And yet there are countless scriptures, plenty of promises attesting to the fact that God wants to bless us, that he wants to prosper us, his people. And so the problem came when the church started to believe that God's blessing of prosperity was for themselves. It was for them to indulge in, for them to get fat on, which of course is never God's intention. But the truth remains, God wants to prosper his people. And when we understand the blessing is so we can be a blessing, then I want to say we'll see his prosperity like we've never known or ever seen before. It's the Abrahamic covenant. You were born to be blessed and you were born to be a blessing. Genesis chapter 12 verses 2 and 3. And so God wants us to prosper and he wants us to prosper in all areas of life. Certainly he wants us to prosper spiritually 
prosper in health, in wealth, in our relationships, in our marriages, and, and, and many other areas. And so he gives us numerous promises asserting to that fact. In Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8, God says to Joshua, keep this law or this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Which again, let me remind you, is God's plan and his desire for each one of us. But note obedience and blessing come as a package. Again, in Psalm 1, it opens by telling us blessed is the person who honors God, who seeks his will and his ways. And I'm paraphrasing here. For they will be like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers, which again is clearly God's design for them. In Jeremiah 29 and verse 11, a a, a verse we all know off by heart, where where God says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. But you know, just before that, God tells them to seek the peace and the prosperity of the city to which I've carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. And so there's no doubt that God wants them to prosper. So much so that he implores them to pray for the prosperity of that ungodly city, because for them to prosper, that city needed to prosper. And yet it would seem, though, that with every promise of prosperity comes a condition of sorts. You know, in Malachi chapter 3, God tells the people of Israel just how much he wants to bless them and how he wants to prosper them, of how he wants to open and throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing on them that they wouldn't have room enough to store it. But you know, for the intent of God to become the promise of God, there was a condition. There was something they had to do, and that was to stop robbing God financially to stop holding out on God with regard to their tithes and their offerings. And friends, in the same way, if you want to live in the fullness of God's promises of prosperity for you, then you need to do and you need to be obedient to what God has said, which we read in verse 10 of that Malachi chapter 3, when he says, bring the whole tithe, not a part of the tithe, not a portion of the tithe, but bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Because you know what? It's only then that we can lay claim to his promise of extravagant blessing and prosperity. And then the third area is promises pertaining to the power of prayer. And you know, if we could believe and if we could own every promise in God's word, when it comes to the power and the effect of prayer, I want to tell you our prayer lives would be very different. Faith may move mountains, but you know, prayer moves God. And so what does God's word promise us when it comes to prayer? Well, James 5 verse 16 is one of those wonderful passages which tells us, or one of those wonderful promises, that the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And you know, if God's word tells us that our prayers are both powerful and effective, Well, you know what? Then we best believe it. And so don't allow your experiences and even your disappointments regarding prayer, maybe of some seemingly unanswered prayers, but don't allow those experiences to fashion your theology. No, our theology, the truth and the promises of God's word is what must shape and what must fashion our experiences. And that's why we can make our prayers a declaration of faith. Why? Because we have the right to expect what God has promised. Now, in the Amplified Version, that wonderful scripture or promise in James 5.16 is put like this. When it says the earnest and heartfelt and continued prayer of a righteous person makes tremendous power available or dynamic in all of its working. But notice it's the earnest, not casual, not half-hearted prayer. It's the heartfelt prayer which means it's got to mean something to us if it's going to mean something to God. And then continued prayer 
in that we can't give up too easily or too quickly. And it's that prayer that makes tremendous power available, dynamic in all that God wants to do. In other words, it's this type of praying that releases God's power to take effect and to bring about mighty results. And you know, prayer carries with it a great promise from God. And you know what that promise is? An answer. Listen to what Jesus says here in John 14, verses 13 to 14. He says, I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Why? Because it's that name, the name of Jesus, that carries weight, that carries authority and all power when it comes to prayer. But remember the context here is prayer aimed at carrying forward the work Jesus did. In 1 John 5, 14 to 15, it tells us that this is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, then whatever we ask, we know that we have what we ask of Him. And anything, notice, in accordance with God's will and God's purpose, not our will, not our motives, not our even our selfish desires, as James 4, 3 clearly reminds us. And so surely this is incentive for us to pray, to know what God's will is, and then to pray in faith, believing that He not only hears us, but He answers our prayers. And yes, sometimes not always as we would like Him to answer, but please know He does answer our prayers. Sometimes it's yes, other times it's no, and sometimes it's wait. But he answers. But in all of this, my point is we really do need to get a revelation and a fresh revelation of the power and the effect of our prayers. And so if we will stand on these promises and if we will personalize and take ownership of them, well, you know, there's no saying then that of what can be done and accomplished through our prayers. But as F.B. Mayer reminds us, the greatest tragedy of life is not unanswered prayer, but unoffered prayer. And so let's offer up our prayers based on the promises of assurance that God gives us when we pray. So I trust this has been helpful. And I trust over these last three weeks, we're able to take these promises and oh, we're so able to stand on them and apply them and pray them out and live in the fullness of that which God has declared and spoken over us. And so let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for the promise and the assurance of your pardon and of your forgiveness towards us. Let us be those who come running to you to receive mercy and grace and forgiveness in our time of need. We thank you for your promises of prosperity towards us. Help us to own them to appropriate those promises in our lives, knowing that you are a generous father who wants to richly provide for us in every way as we remain faithful in doing what you ask and what you require of us. And then lastly, Lord, we thank you for the promises pertaining to the power of prayer, the power of our prayers. You have made some audacious promises which we choose to believe and to stand on no matter what's going on around us. Because if you've said it, then we believe it. And that settles it. And so help us, Father, as we live in the fullness of these incredible promises. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day. And hopefully we see you next Sunday in our building. God bless. Thank you, Mark, for that great encouragement. Let's take a moment to consider what Mark's just shared with us. The pardon we have received, the prosperity we enjoy, and the power of prayer available to us. Let's take a moment and grab hold of something that God has planted in our hearts and resolve to put into practice for God's glory. On the matter of power of prayer, please join us tonight as we pray up a storm. 
for our country, for God's kingdom to come. Thank you again to everyone who's contributed to the service today. We pray that uh, each of you will be blessed as you have given. And um, a special thanks to Frankie for his message. Now I just want to leave you with the words of Paul in Thessalonians. May the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people, just as we do for you, so that he, that's Jesus, may establish our hearts without blame and holiness before God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all the saints. God bless you. Have a great week and we will see you next week. God bless you.